Welcome to episode 198 of the Ski Podcast. Thanks for joining us, listener. Today, we're going to be talking to a record-breaking ski adventurer, finding out how I got on traveling to Ladies Out by Train. And we have an on-the-spot update from the SIGB ski test in La Clusa. Now, my name is Ian Martin, and this is one of those rare occasions where I only have a single guest with me. I'm delighted to welcome Preet Shandy, who around a month ago became the world's fastest woman to complete a solo unsupported ski expedition to the South Pole. Uh, hi, Preet. How are you? How are you feeling after that big adventure? I'm good. Feeling pretty good after this one, actually, which is it's a really nice feeling because after some of the others, I wasn't feeling so good. Normally, I say to my guests at this point, when did you ski or snowboard last? But I'm guessing <laughs> the last time you had skis on, you were somewhere around the South Pole. Yeah, you know what's funny? So I finished on the 28th of December and there's this amazing woman, Donna, who was back in Union Glacier Camp doing doing a, an epic ultramarathon around the camp. So I was like, oh, I'll join for a little bit. And I joined for like the smallest amount. And it's so funny because I felt OK. I was like, I feel OK. And I did, I don't know, probably 30 minutes if less on skis, just like quite slowly. And I was like, oh, I feel quite tired now. <laughs> Yeah, well, probably you still had, still had all the adrenaline uh, flying around your system. Well, we'll we'll come on to your adventure and your record a little bit later on. To start off with, then, I asked you, you know, if you've been skiing. I mentioned earlier I was just out in Ladies Out at the weekend. I was mainly there for a, a running race, but I did ski. So, uh, listen, I can tell you that in Ladies Out, conditions were very good above around, you know, 1,800, 1,900 metres. Earlier in the week before we'd come, it had actually rained below that, which meant that those slopes coming back into the resort, which Ladies Out is like 1,600 metres, 1,650 metres, they were a little bit icy, pretty hard packed underfoot. But above that, Skiing conditions, absolutely fabulous. And in Ladies Out, where it goes up to 3,600 metres with the glacier there, lots of really, really good skiing. And in fact, as I was leaving, they had a little bit more snow with the snow rain line again around 2,000 metres. And that's been something that we've seen around the Alps. But I do have a few snow reports from some of our regular contributors. So let's have a listen to a few of those. Hi, Ian. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. And what a happy new year it's been so far. Today, the 22nd of January 2024, <clears throat> we have had probably 20 of some of the most fantastic snow days of any season I can I, I can remember. Since the turn of the year, the snow has been pretty epic. On and off good, sort of one day good, one day a bit overcast and cloudy, one day a little bit rainy, next day phenomenal. Off-piece skiing has been good to excellent. Some fantastic days, some great ski touring weather and relatively safe pretty much all around the mountain as well. But on the piece, the piece are in fine, fine condition. Really lovely for cruising around, burning around the whole of the Alberg. A little bit icy in parts in some areas, but a lot of people careful to not, not to confuse ice with nice and crisp, hard pack. Great for, for, for speeding around, which has been awesome. Snowforecast.com is saying for the next couple of days, it's going to be a little bit of snow coming tonight and on Wednesday, with temperatures dropping again quite cold. But obviously, there is no substitute for just looking out the window or having a ski. I was definitely fortunate enough this morning. I was on the first lifts at 8.45, going up the Nazarene gondola. I put on a pretty quick hour and a half before coming into work. Sped over to Steuben, dodged all the crowds, no queues. Lovely, lovely, fat, flat, well-prepared piece. And got to Steuben and back again in, in just over an hour, which for those uncultured people is actually pretty good going. Thank you. So the, it was a little bit overcast. There was that definite smell of a storm in the air. So while um, Storm Isha or Ida or Etna is, seems to be battering the UK at the moment, perhaps the Alps are getting some of the, uh, the overdue or the overspill of, the, of that storm coming our way. It definitely smelled like a storm. The wind was starting to pick up. The light had gone a bit flat. The clouds had come over by sort of 10, 10.30 in the morning. So perhaps this snow forecast will ring true and we are... Hopefully expecting a nice dump over the next three or four days. So yeah, 20, 30 centimetres of fresh snow would be fantastic on top of the already great pack that we've already got here in the Alberg. That's the weather forecast from St Anton. Garbled, fast, quick, but that's just how I like to ski as well. Thanks everyone. Till next time.
Hi Ian, it's Bethany sending you a snow report from La Clusa and the French Alps and also last weekend I was in Les Arcs in the French Alps as well. I'm here in La Clusa at the SIGB ski test. We've had a mixture of conditions in, in two days already. We had some kind of hard pack peace and then we had a bit of rain and a bit of snow up high yesterday which was Monday and then today yeah a little bit of fresh a little bit of rain affected snow lower down but the piece is still skiing really well Les Arc last weekend was off the scale blue sky powder a perfect piece it couldn't have got much, much better so in terms of snow dips generally across the Alps looking very very good and lower down like I say a bit bit rain affected but anyone going on holiday higher up is is laughing we're having a great season up and down but generally I can't say much more thumbs up so anyone heading up holidays and thinking about half-term holidays I'm sure you have a great time thanks Ian hi Ian Alex from 150 days of winter with a three valley snow report Yesterday, I spent the day at Valtoran ski testing a selection of next year's planks. Woke up to a fiery red sky, which signifies incoming bad weather. And about 3pm, right on cue, the clouds came in and so did the fresh snow. Not an amazing amount of snow, but still a good dump. The temperatures in January have been how you would expect, and subsequently, all the peaks in the three valleys are in really great condition. Weather for the next week is forecast much warmer. So we've had a good January. Let's hope for an equally good February. And on that bombshell, I hope there is soft snow under your skis in the near future. Uh, so if you're heading out for snow this winter, listener, don't forget you can save money when you book your ski hire at InsportRent.com and use the code Ski Podcast. You get a guaranteed discount for all ski hire in France, Austria and Switzerland. And to make it even simpler, you don't need to use that code. You can just take the link in the show notes and your basket will automatically be reduced. Uh, personally, I don't have skis myself. I don't really like the faff of trying to carry them when you're going back and forth. And I, I do tend to go by train. But if you were flying, there's no ski carriage costs. And during your week when you rent, you can change your skis at any time. So if you want to support the Ski Podcast and save yourself some money, then use that code Ski Podcast or, or take the link in the show notes. We're going to move on to news now. There have been quite a few things going on. Firstly, we had a competition, Ski Podcast, to win a bunch of prizes from Le Trois Valet. Uh, congratulations, Andrea Dalton, who's won that. I actually sent her a message on Facebook and she told me it's her 50th birthday oh. on the very day I contacted her. So that can be a birthday present as well as a prize. Team GB wise, fantastic day at Kitzbühel at the weekend for Britain's slalom skiers. Dave Riding came fifth, Billy Major 13th and Laurie Taylor 19th. That is the first time three British athletes have finished in the top 20 of an Alpine World Cup race. Uh, so that is really impressive. And in fact, it inspired one of the younger skiers coming through, Zach Carrick-Smith, who saw those results in the morning and then the afternoon went out and won gold in the Youth Olympic Winter Games, which are currently taking place in Gangwon, which I think is in South Korea. And since then, he's also won a silver medal in the GS, I think. This is very, very hot off the uh, press, that one, because I think it happened uh, earlier today. But those are Britain's first ever, or his is Britain's first ever gold medal at any Olympic competition in alpine skiing. And a few other updates from British skiers and snowboarders. The Lax Open took place last week. No, no podiums, but it was great to see Katie Ormrod uh, back from injury for the first time since March 22. And Jasmine Taylor regular on the pod, won back-to-back -back golds in the uh, Telemark Sprint World Cup over in Carezza in the Dolomites. She is having a brilliant season. Uh, tonight, as we record, today is Wednesday the 24th of Jan. This won't get published until Thursday, but the Schladming night ski will be going on uh, the slalom there. So hopefully Dave, Billy and Laurie will be able to get some results in there. And then coming up this weekend in Aspen, it's the X Games where Mia Brooks and Zoe Atkin will be there. So uh, regular listeners will remember I've taken the flight free pledge this year not to take any flights during 2024. And so this was actually my first trip overseas during 2024. And I took the train down to Ladies Alps. And this is a journey I haven't done before. I've done lots of journeys uh, by train to the Alps. But this one, you take the Eurostar to Paris, cross Paris, and then very fast train to Grenoble. It only took three hours, hit 280 kilometers per hour at that uh, at one point. If you have a look on YouTube, I've put a video on there about it. And I've blogged about it on Ski Flight Free as well as how you can do it. 
Uh, Pre, can I just ask you a question? Travel yeah. by train much? Uh, you know, I know you obviously have to, uh, you know, fly if you're going to the Antarctica. I actually lived in Czech Republic from the age of 16 to 19, and I used to go everywhere by train. <laughs> so, so all over to try and get to different tennis tournaments. So, yeah. Big, big fan of, you know, getting public transport when I can. I happen to know as well, Brie, that you've done quite a few ultra marathons and a lot of running races. I mean, you mentioned there you play tennis. I know you play tennis to quite a high level when you were younger and then your attention moved from tennis to running. I, I just did a marathon in the uh, Alps at the weekend. Have you done any kind of sort of races like that? I'd read about Marathon Disciples when I was given a Secret Santa book and it was like the hundreds toughest world challenges or something like that in the book and I remember looking at this race I was like that sounds insane like you know at that point I can't remember how old I was when I saw it it was probably in my my early 20s I saw it thinking that is something that sounds so far out of my reach. And for the benefit of the listener Marathon Disciples is almost the opposite of what I did this weekend that is a five-day stage race through the uh, desert in Morocco right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's one of those you end, I entered alone, but I was put with um, seven other people in the tent and they were great. And we're still in touch today. We literally still have our tent group. Hey, well, uh, evidently we have that in common. Just to uh, give you a bit of background on what I did at the weekend, it was called Les Lumières de la Moselle. And it's a trail race. You start at around 2000 metres at the top of the Super Venos Glyph in Ladies Alp. And then you run down for a bit and then you do a few loops on a 300 metre climb. And he's starting in the daylight for me at around three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so the first lap going up the hill, it was daylight. The second lap going up the hill, the sun was setting and it was absolutely beautiful. It really was just those images they use in their promotion. This beautiful pink rose sunset going on, almost perfect uh, for them. And by the time you finish that, then you've got to put head torches on and you're running through the dark on the trail. And the third lap was uh, was you know in the dark at night, but this sort of thing I love, and for me I love any time you know being in the mountains. It did reduce the amount of time I had skiing. I was in a ski resort, I didn't do a lot of skiing, but I did do some. But Katie Bamber, who's been on the show before, she was last on the show on 172, telling us about the Oak Route. She did the race, the half marathon, and I spoke to her afterwards to see what she thought. We're on our way back. We're in Grenoble Station, about to get the train back to the UK. I'm here with Katie Bamber. You've been on the podcast several times before. How are you feeling just now, Katie? Because you just ran a half marathon over the mountains the other day. Yeah, I'm feeling surprisingly OK, actually. My Straight after the event, it was my lungs that were aching, actually. I think it was like the dry air and the cold air as well i think it was minus nine when yeah we did the rain from it and then yesterday i had a ski in the afternoon which seems to be yeah i mean i'm impressed with your recovery powers admittedly i did do the longer distance but i definitely didn't feel like skiing and um, but in terms of the race itself then i mean you've never I, i've had the benefit of doing a few you know races in the mountains before what did you think about being out on the mountains well in the dark as well yeah, I mean, it was incredible. The most I ever run is 10K, and it tends to be in the flat in London. and Or, or you know, jogs every now and then in the mountains, but never 21K. I mean, it was incredible to be on the hill. We started at dusk, you know, when the sun the sun had left the mountain, yeah. so it was pretty cold. And then we came over, we kind of crested this ridge line on the on the downhill when we first started, and it was the most beautiful mountain sunset, you know, pastel skies. And, uh, yeah, I have to say, uh, we were talking to one of the organisers yesterday, and in all of their uh, promo for the event, they've got this incredible, beautiful pink rose sunset, and that's exactly what we had for the yeah. event itself, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very cool. And then the last... So what, what I was running for just under three hours, the last... Uh, well, at least half of it was in pitch black, but it was also very cool to see everyone in front of you's <laughs> head torches winding down the mountains. Yeah, the snake. yeah, it looks yeah. great. I, I, again, I was chatting to Sir Laurent, one of the orcs, telling me that he had a friend who lived lives over in Outdoors, who could see this line of torches snaking down uh, from Outdoors. What about did you did you feel warm enough when you were doing the race? Yeah, definitely. I was I was worried about what to wear before. Yeah, it was plenty warm enough during the race. There wasn't much wind, which helped. And the temperature had risen five or so degrees from the night before. So Yeah, and what, right. do you, what do you think about the climb then? Because the marathoners, we had to do that three times. You had to do it once. How did it feel? <laughs> yeah, once was enough. It felt very long. It felt like Groundhog Day going up and up <laughs> around these switchbacks. But yeah. how, how long did you say the... Uh, it was 325 metres vertical. Okay. I can't yeah. recall exactly how long it took. 
It felt like an hour climbing, which it can't have been, but you probably did an hour overall. Yeah, I, I don't know, but you know, I love that going up through the the trees there, and you know, the moonlight shining through. Because I'm guessing they scheduled the event. I didn't really look at the sky too much. I was looking at the stars. You know, they look great. But was it a full moon? No, about it was over half. Yeah, over half. It certainly felt very bright, and with everyone's head torches. And in fact, as it goes, uh, my head torch was like tucked away, and I had real trouble getting it out. And I didn't want to take my backpack off, and so I didn't even put it on in the end. And I just uh, kind of ran with the light of everyone else's, and that was enough. Yeah, well, it was a, it was a really good race. I really enjoy kind of any time in the mountains, but just the opportunity to uh, to do that sort of thing. And uh, you know, we're going to go back down to sea level now, and we'll be super fit, right? Because we've been training at altitude. <laughs> Right, thanks very much, Katie. So that might sound, I don't know, to some people quite challenging, running a, uh, a marathon up and down mountains. But for Preet, that's pretty straightforward stuff when you're the person who's just broken the, the record to become the fastest woman to complete a solo, unsupported ski expedition to the South Pole. So congratulations for that. I think I'm right in saying you covered over a thousand kilometers in doing that. Is that right? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. And it, you know, it, like I said, it, it was it was a relatively like well, it was smoother journey, I should say, than some of my previous ones. And it was really good to get into the South Pole. And, you know, actually, this is the first trip I've done where when I finished, I felt like that, you know, just that last little bit. It was like the last 30 seconds I was able to speed up. And I've never had that before. And I have to say that was such a joy to have that and not feel like, yeah, <laughs> I can't do anymore. Right, well, let's get to grips with exactly what that is then. So solo, we can all understand that. You did that on your own. And we're talking about how many days you were on your own for just then? So this one was 31 days, 19 hours, 13 minutes. No seconds. You don't know how many seconds it was as well? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, so firstly, that's a long time to be on your own. Most people will never experience that in their lives. So that is one particular challenge. Then the other part of the record is you are unsupported. So yeah. there's not anyone kind of meeting you halfway and dropping off supplies. You've got to take everything right. with you. Yes, yes. Everything with me and my sled. So you're basically prepping for if anything goes wrong. So what medical kit might I need? What repair kit might I need? Hoping you don't need things. But yes, yeah, you have everything with you. Yeah. And you're on skis. So this is a ski podcast. Let's just start <laughs> with the skis then, the actual kit that you've got. I mean, what were you on for this? Yeah, so, you know, so I've journey? used Asnes skis for every trip that I've done. So the Asnes, so I went from the Ausland skis to the slightly thinner, the racing skis on this one. And I start off with long skins on this this route that I've taken the start there's a bit of an incline so just want to kind of get up that incline and to be honest the whole route you're gradually going up but you know the, the first bit and your sleds are is heaviest so it's just to help me get up there really and then pretty much as soon as I'm up there like three four days as soon as I can swap onto the short skins I do the, my skis have been really good I mean I carry a spare binding with me on previous trips I've carried a spare ski because you know if anything happens to that ski I'm a little bit stuck I generally carry a yeah. spare ski pole as well because again if anything happens to that ski pole I'm a little bit stuck but so with those skis there, do they have to be particularly you know strong or strengthened if they're covering such a distance you know being used so much over a short period of time they do. And I think I'm, you know, looking in a sense that a lot of the kit I'm using, I'm not the first person using this kit. So I, I mean, I started learning about Antarctic expeditions not that long ago, really, like four years ago, maybe four and a half years ago. And I didn't know where to start. So I literally, you know, on Google searching, created my social media, followed everyone that had anything to do with Antarctica and, and asked a million and one questions. And these skis has been have been used over and over again. Um, and it's the same with the kit that I used, like the MSR stove that I used to cook. Like it's been used over and over again. And I think I only heard actually of one person who'd broken the ski. Like sometimes people have issues with bindings, but then it's knowing your kit as well, right? So knowing how the bindings have been screwed in so that actually you can replace a binding if you need to. And I'll be honest, before doing these trips, like it's stuff that I didn't know at all. It's like with anything, once you get to know your kit and equipment, it then doesn't seem as complicated. Sorry, can I just track back to the skins yeah. you were talking about? You said yeah. you changed so that to start off with, you got a bit of a steeper bit and you, you changed to shorter skins. Is that what yeah. you said? Yeah. Why Why is that? How does that work? They, they're not yeah. covering the whole ski? 
they're not covering the whole ski yeah so so I could get more of a glide so basically to start with I want a little bit more grip so that I can get up this slightly steeper section and my sled is at its heaviest don't get me wrong I'm sure there are people who are you know much better skiers who could probably do it on short skins you know I'm not to be honest so I I I thought that I would need the longer skins to be able to get up that section and then the short skins so that it's like I said it's a gradual incline then but then I've got the shorter skins and I can try and get that glide yeah and a key point that you mentioned evidently is it's not just you and your body weight and whatever you might have in a backpack or something you're actually towing a sled behind you because it is unsupported you've got all of those things that you mentioned that you're taking with you how much is that weighing so for this funny enough this trip I didn't actually weigh it you know but it would have been about 75 to 80 kilograms so previous trips I've weighed my sled and I just wanted to do things a bit different I didn't want the number in my head I was just like, I don't want to know. I don't yeah. know. Let's say it's such a difficult day. And, you know, I didn't want a pre, you know, last year you you dragged 120 kilogram sled. This one is, you know, whatever, 75, 80 kilos. You know, and yeah, so it was much lighter. <laughs> Well, actually, I mean, that is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, during the, the, the race that I did, and a lot of the times if I'm doing like a longer race, I often deliberately don't look to see how far I've gone or how far I've got to the finish because you don't want to necessarily be thinking about these things the impact on your on the mental side of things and we might as well there's other elements to do with your kit that I'd like to discuss but let's move on to that now I mean you're on your own that's a long time like I said most people in their lives will never spend that amount of time on their own how did you handle that side of things it's funny for this trip it didn't seem to be as much of an issue I mean having the experience of the previous two trips that I've done and actually you know let's be honest when things are going to plan mentally that helps you know when things aren't going to plan mentally that's really difficult and this trip things were going to plan you know I wasn't behind time at any point you know it can be difficult being on your own I try to you know I do listen to audiobooks when I go along I love listening to comedy because I love anything light-hearted and that can make me laugh and what's really interesting, I listened to some songs that I'd listened to on the second trip. And the second trip is where I did 70 days solo, started with 120 kilogram sled, was very, very difficult. And I think I had almost a tra- like like a trauma response to that, that music because I hadn't listened to it in a little while. Mm-hmm. And yeah, to hear them again was like, oh, I remember, you know, that that feeling <laughs> of that of that second trip and how difficult it was. But there are times when it can be a, a bit of a mental prison. And, you know, sometimes I will count to myself. Sometimes I'll focus just on my breath and I won't think about anything else whatsoever. I will re- I'll find I try really hard to daydream about just something completely different. So I'm getting married in March and I was trying to, like, yep. think about wedding things and just and then I'll be like, oh, how much time? Did that help me pass? And it's really hard sometimes when it's like two minutes and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, firstly, congratulations on that. You Thank said, you. you know, thinking about you know, being mindful. Do you have a, a mantra or mantras that, you know, you used on a regular basis? Yeah. So it's, I will count a lot. I will count a lot of the time. And then sometimes I will, I will say, Wahiguji ki kasa, Wahiguji ki fate. So like first words of like, a prayer, seek prayer. And I would just say that, or I would just say Wahiguru a lot, just in my voice. And I think for me, it's, I don't know, it, it does help. It makes me feel a little bit calmer at times. I, I tell myself I'm okay a lot. So sometimes I used to use a lot of positive reinforcement, like you're okay, you're doing really well, you're doing so well. And it's just constant because on my second trip, and I know I talk about that a lot, but to be honest, it, it was so rough that trip. And, you know, I only finished it like start of last year and then I went back and I it was so rough that I don't I don't think this one would have gone that smoothly if I hadn't gone through that but I remember falling down like 14 times every two hours towards the end the last week I was running out of food like it was brutal and I just constantly kept saying to myself you're okay You're, you're doing so well just keep going you're doing so well and I just yeah I felt broken to be honest like I I felt like I pushed past my limits and I've never done that before. Well, I guess, you know, that is one of 
probably the reasons that you choose to do this and why lots of people choose to do these type of things so they want to test and find out what their limits are and see how they uh, progress and I find that really interesting and certainly I'm a huge believer in positive mental reinforcement for all aspects but particularly if you're in any race even if it's your local 5k park run just you know keeping it in your mind that you're doing really well that things are going really well uh, turning away you know immediately rejecting negative thoughts when they come into your mind you know, it can be hugely beneficial you mentioned on that uh, previous trip that you were struggling for food uh, there's a Ironman triathlete called Dave Scott who uh, I think he used to say you know if you if you're feeling good smile and if you're feeling bad eat <laughs> what are we using to fuel yourself for this trip so I work with a dart so I'm from Derby I work with a Derby company called Basecamp Foods who are brilliant and um, I use their freeze-dried food in the in the mornings and the evenings so and then and, and, you know, I, the food is nice. So like I had spaghetti bolognese in the in the evening. I had pasta with salmon, some of my favorite meals. And then during the day, basically a mixture of things. So I had 5000 calories a day, including it all. And it would be like chocolate, raisins, nuts, flapjacks. I work with a nutritionist and basically we were looking or she was looking at getting the most amount of calories, 100 gram. And obviously you don't want it to be heavy, too. So sometimes I would say, I like this food and then she might offer a substitute for that where I can get more calories because, you know, still lose 10 kilos on that trip. Second trip, I lost 20 kilos. So once that fat has gone and you want the fat because you don't, don't want to lose muscle first, you know, you start losing muscle. Like you can feel the difference for sure. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a combination. You're getting more tired anyway because you've been on the trip. You're losing weight and you start coming up to altitude as well. So I think a combination or all of that like throughout the trips, I've never been as quick towards the end than I am at the start. That's entirely understandable. So many questions I'm having as you're uh, talking there. It's really interesting. I mean, you mentioned about that kind of trail mix that you might be eating as you go along, but presumably it's pretty cold. I mean, you can't be taking your gloves off to eat this stuff. Can no, you? So, so everything. So there's so much prep in the kit and the food. So all of that food has been chopped up in small pieces. And then I put them in, in separate bag. you know, I put them in a, a bag so that I've got my mitts on and that I can still have dexterity and just eat. And you end up, <laughs> it's so flattering. You like to turn around but you put your big down jacket on every hour so I stop every hour quick stop turn around so that because it's normally headwind and you're just quickly getting food in a bit of water keep going so so you know you're constantly trying to get a little bit of food on board but yeah everything is chopped up into small pieces there's nothing that I should be having to take kind of big bites of because I don't want any any dental injuries or to break any teeth so in relation to temperatures then I mean you've got the actual temperature and then the wind chill temperature yeah. what were you dealing with so that, it's the wind chill, you know, that absolutely. So on this trip, it for me, it got as cold as minus 30 towards the end. But I think that was with the wind chill. So but usually the last trips, I haven't received weather updates. So I actually don't know. It's funny because this trip, you know, went relatively well. For me, the year before was so much colder. And again, it's subjective. I don't actually know. However, I say I don't know. I'm pretty sure the last trip was colder because I was trying to be completely subjective about it <laughs> yeah I mean it is very difficult for sure we all know if we're feeling cold and you know recently we did a podcast where we were talking about the best gloves yeah. and you know different people have obviously have different uh, let's say internal heating in terms of clothing then so you must have learned from your previous trips did you change things around and you know what were you wearing you must have amazing gloves you know for that kind of trip yeah you know I'll be honest so my I didn't change clothing a huge amount so for example I use merino wool base layers and I like those merino wool base layers like they've worked pretty well for me in the past and I did I changed one or two things for example I've used a down skirt in the past and actually I prefer prefer down down shorts you know everyone will prefer different things but I've quite long legs and I've got a long stride and even then zipping the down skirt up I then almost I felt like I was defeating the point of having the down skirt whereas the down shorts this year I loved I didn't find them restrictive I would say they're probably not as easy to take on and you know put off as the down skirt so there's pros and cons to it but I had my Canada Goose kind of big jacket on top which is perfect I layer I prefer mitts so I don't, I don't have any kind of five finger gloves. I took some of them on my first trip, but I didn't use them. And again, that's personal preference. So I literally have liner mitts, bigger mitts, bigger mitts on top, and then pogies. So if I need dexterity, I've still got 
you know, two mitts on my liner mitts and then the lighter weight mitts um, on top because, you know, I find that my, my hands get cold quickly. So it's a trial and error. Yeah. Four layers of gloves then. Is that what you just said? Yeah. That's but it's a, you know, the liner mitt is, you know, it's a thin mitt. It's a liner. And then the, the kind of light, it's a lightweight mitt. So on their own, yeah, I wouldn't really wear them on their own. But saying that, some some days are like can be very warm like especially this trip is probably the the warmest it's been at the start for me I would say and those days I've just got those two layers and they're lightweight layers the pogies like you want to be able to put layers on quickly because the weather can change very quickly as well and so I really like pogies but I get them from the logistics yeah yeah you have to tell me it's not a word I've come across before what are they so, you know, it's funny because it's probably a word I didn't know either. So you put them over your ski pole um, and it's a cover. I think people use them on bikes as well. So it's it's an easy, all I need to do is put my hand in and then I've got my, you know, I grip onto the ski pole as I would usually. So it's an extra layer. And it's it's a really good one. I think you're most likely to see them on uh, people, you know, driving delivery scooters yeah, and things yeah. like that around town. Yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about now. And so you've got your skis, you've got your, uh, you know, skins on, you're, you're well wrapped up, you're feeding yourself as you go. But this being a long journey, you know, over a, a month, you have to stop overnight so you have a tent in that sled uh, as well you've got to put up that tent every night and stay in that tent is that how that you know how it works Uh, and again I've used my same Hilleberg tent that I have um, and which is which is great but yeah you just you you're skiing along and generally it's time so you know okay I've done my 12 hours today I'm going to set a place to camp and the terrain is different it depends on you know whereabouts you are so if there's a lot of sastrugi which are the wind-shaped ridges obviously you don't want to put your tent up on the top of that so you find a good place to to kind of set up tent sometimes it's just really easy and you can just stop where you are because you know the snow is is good and as long as it's it's flat or you're trying to find obviously somewhere relatively flat and not too bumpy but yeah and then and then you set up your tent obviously on windier days it takes a little bit longer to do I had uh, I think it was, it was my first trip actually the I put the peg in to secure my my tent and then went to come round to put the poles in and it blew and oh. it, like yeah I caught it but I like honestly I just like was there for a second on my knees like oh my god I cannot yeah didn't make that mistake again but <laughs> yeah I'm sure you wouldn't so then it's like refueling resting and you know I had a look on your uh, social channels and you know filming a bit of video which no one in presumably is going to see for something until you get back because you got no internet how do you keep all your your um, devices charged yeah great so I have a solar panel so the solar panel charges my power bank and then I power bank charges my phone to be honest I try to take take minimal so I work with GTC company who give me my sat phone so I've got sat phone device called Iridium Go which um, you can send photos back with sometimes and then I have my phone my GPS devices so my phone I use to listen to audiobooks sometimes that was again it was my second trip audible it looked like it had signed out and again I was like <gasps> having this like panic and I turned my phone off and on again and luckily it was okay because I, I don't have internet to connect to so if it's out it's out so uh, then I'll be singing to myself all the way but I, yeah I take photos and videos this trip I probably took the least I've ever taken because I was super rigid on my timings like I needed to sleep as much as I could to then go the next day. If the worst came to the worst and you know let's say your tent had blown away is there like a panic button or something you can press to be collected not quite a button but so I work with a company called Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions who pretty much do what they say on the tin they are my logistical support and my medical support when I'm on the ground so they from Chile they get us into Antarctica and I have a a GPS tracker that they are tracking so for safety purposes so if that was to happen I'd probably contact them I mean I'd use my shovel and probably dig in for the night unless it's like a great weather day (laughs) they might not be able to come and get you straight away so obviously there's that delay but that's why there's a process to go through in the first place so I actually when I first applied to them I wanted to do the traverse crossing and they said no because I didn't have enough experience which is fair enough like they don't want you to go out there and then and then have trouble so then I I did my first trip in order to get experience for the my the crossing attempt and uh, yeah and then obviously came back a third time (laughs) And well, listener, if you were therefore, if you were thinking, listening to this and listening to Preet, oh, yeah, you know, I'll try that as well. 
yeah, bit of experience would be useful. Can, can I ask a couple of questions? So many yes. thoughts crossing my mind during our conversation here. But you mentioned, you know, it gets harder as you go on because the altitude is a bit higher. Yeah. You know, what what is the altitude when you're getting near to the pole? Then? So it's not it's not that high. It's like around two thousand eight hundred meters, but it feels higher to the point where been I haven't been hugely high, but kind of up Mont Blanc, and but you can feel it without a doubt now it's been a mixture so this year I could still feel it but it didn't feel as bad but the previous two years and maybe that's a combination with exhaustion I have been out of breath you know where I've had to stop and then keep going 2800 meters while you're saying yeah it's not like uh, the Himalayas or something like that that's still high enough you know if you're towing something that's you know 70 kilos behind you yeah, to think- uh, to feel it for sure yeah. I think it's, you know, I, in, in my mind, I'm thinking I've gone up gradually. So I've not just kind of, I've gone there. So I think more in that sense, you know, just having been at that height in different places, it, it definitely affects me differently there. Like I feel it more when I'm there. And can I ask a question as well? So when you're coming to the end, you know, you know, you're getting there. I'm not 100% sure if this was on this trip, but I was reading somewhere that you can see the plane that you've got to get to hours before you actually get to it. Is that, is that how it works? So that was a second trip and that was brutal because I I, I wasn't going to make my end. So there was a plane to come and pick me up. They, they'd they been there for four days. Um, and the reason is what nobody wants is for me to finish. I then have to wait for a weather window and someone to come in. So basically they looked at where they thought I could get to within the time of my cutoff date. Cutoff date, the, past, the last passenger flight of Antarctica for the logistics company was literally the next day. And so I could see the plane in the distance. It was a low cloud and you just see this dot because anything that's, you know, not white in Antarctica, you're like, that's something there. And it, yeah, it took me hours to get there. But that was, I mean, that was a different kind of brutal, to be honest. It just... Yeah. Even I remember when it was like 0.2 nautical miles away. And I know it was that far because I had to take my GPS out and check because I could see it getting closer. But it was, you know, I was not in a good way at that point. And I was so hungry. That sounds like a really challenging one on on that trip. I know you're on a career break uh, at the moment, but you are an officer in the army. And I, I imagine that's probably helped you. But listeners might not be aware i mean perhaps they could guess from the fact that you mentioned the sikh mantras and your name is a uh, pre that you're an asian woman and you mentioned being you know you need to be able to get permissions to be able to do this sort of thing have you found any you know challenges in that respect approaching it as a woman or as an asian woman yes there were challenges for sure but i think for so many different reasons so i first had the idea kind of just before covid and then you know, I'm in the regular army in a medical regiment. And, you know, then we were almost kind of right, you know, what what are we going to need to do? So I did approach people who weren't really interested. So then I just did everything on leave. So, you know, I was like, well, when I have time to train, I'm going to train. And I just had this determination to do it. What's hard is a lot of the time, a lot of the barriers are from your own community. So, you know, forget going wider out, like, you know, why aren't you doing the norm? Like, I feel like there's a lot of expectations to fit into this box. At a point, you kind of get used to people telling you that you can't do things or that's not for you. Or, you know, I I need to like, you know, have a house and settle down because that's a thing that is seen as as achievement or that you know I have some family some family members are so proud you know they are but I think they realized what I was doing probably more when it was in the paper and I'm not sure if it wasn't in the paper that it would have been as recognized and then some family members who literally haven't recognized it at all so I could have literally been nowhere (laughs) Right. But it's interesting because I know that, you know, you do a lot of public speaking about these challenges. And also, I think one of your motivations is trying to let people understand that you can achieve anything, right? Yeah, 100 percent. But also to be like honest about the challenges, you know, and, and be honest about the lows. Like I came back after the first trip in a lot of debt. And I was struggling. You know, I'm an army officer now. I've I've done three big trips in Antarctica. But, you know, I joined the army as a private soldier. I did an access course to get onto my degree to do physio. I was told I wasn't smart enough. So I think, to be honest, you know, I want to be relatable because it was hard to get there. I never, ever thought I would get a speed record, ever. I never thought I'd be quick enough. 
But you know what? You work to your strengths. It's not because I'm the quickest, but I have very good admin. I was like, you know, what can I do? I probably did long, much longer days than someone who's a better skier. But that's what you do. You, you know, you work to, yeah, your advantage. And there will always be people who think you cannot do it. I mean, at the start, I think so many people thought I was joking (laughs) and were like, you don't look like a polar explorer, you know, and we just make little jokes and quips about, about me wanting to do it. But I think you're going to get that. And you know what? When I then got there the first time, I was that that reward was unbelievable because I'd got I'd made it past all those people who told me I couldn't do it. That, that's fantastic, and you know, there's an evident answer to what does a polar explorer look like? It's you know, <laughs> it looks like anyone and anyone you know can do it if they put their mind to it. You spent a lot of time on skis. Do you actually ski downhill at all? <laughs> <laughs> so I've tried once and I wasn't very good, but it's my partner is a downhill skier. So I, I have to train to get better. So I, you know, I think I'll be taking lessons because I definitely need lessons to, yeah, to, to be better. And I'd like to go with him. So hopefully in the future, I'll become a downhill skier. Oh, excellent. Well, we'd be delighted to to welcome you to, to that community. And just, you know, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Very inspirational all of that. I'm going to put a whole bunch of links into the show notes. So listener, you can uh, have a look at some of Preet's videos and find out a little bit more about that. But yeah, congratulations on that record and, and all of your achievements. So it was interesting hearing Preet talking about all of her equipment there. Regular listeners will know that Al and I have recently been doing lots of specials about best gloves and the best skis and the best ski boots. And Al is now out at the SIGB ski test in La Clusa. And he sent in this update. Hi, it's Al from Ski Kit Info. And I'm here at the SIGB ski test in La Clusa. And it may be a bit loud because there's a bit of a party going on. There's peace bashers going out for the evening's work because we are in a ski resort and it's pretty awesome. I'm here with Amy Marwick who looks after socials and marketing for the SIGB, the snow sport industries of Great Britain and she's also a fall line test member. So Amy, how do, why do we have the ski test here? Why do we have it here? Yeah, why do we have it? I mean, why why does it exist? Well, it's the whole point is so that the retailers can come, they can test the skis they're going to buy in their shops, and also it gives them a really good idea of how the skis actually ski and who they're really suited to best. So when someone comes into their shop, they can say, look, I've tried this ski, it's maybe not for me, but it'll be definitely good for you, or vice versa. And yeah, it's just a really great way to get used to all the new gear that's coming ahead of next season. It's pretty amazing to see how many retailers come out and ski the product. So when you're going in a shop in the UK and you think, oh, they're not in the mountains, it's incredible to spend so much time making sure that they're stuck in the right kit. And and more importantly, I think they've been on it and know it. It's it's amazing. There's a load of retailers, load of media. So you're here with Four Line as well. That's right. And what are you doing for Four Line? So for Four Line, we are testing as many skis as we can and getting through all the new kits specifically because we've been coming and doing this for a while now, so getting used to a lot of the skis that are out there and checking out the new stuff and then we go home at the end of the day, write it all up, find out on our what's our favourite stuff and then write our reviews for the gear guide um, which is, comes out in the autumn. So is that, that this winter, next winter? Next so, winter. It will come out next week. Yeah, yeah sorry. Next I week. knew the answer. It's just exciting. <laughs> um, okay, and so do you have to, like, so here, I know how it works, but just to, so we can explain to everybody. Yeah. So you don't have to book out skis, but every, you have to register to come and test. That's so right, you're yeah. with Four Line Hours here with Ski Kit Info, and we're testing all of next season's product, especially the new stuff, as Amy says. So is there anything particularly that's emerging, new trends, colorways, technologies? What have you seen? Yeah, we've seen a lot of color, color-wise. We've seen a lot of teal, a lot of kind of turquoisey, greeny colours, lots of kind of muted, stony earth tones. Yeah. yeah. A lot of that in the clothing um, and in some of the skis yeah. as well, actually. Some nice sort of some nice sort of lineups of skis that all kind of look really nicely together. Whether they stand out on the rack or not is yet to be. So to paint the picture, Amy's wearing a Patagonia outfit for next season and it's kind of dark green, but there's a K2 ski that she was on earlier with purple at the tip and tail and it's amazing how it matches the outfit and, and Katie from Four Line they were caught up a bit on the hill same thing totally different colourway loads of that kind of mint almost turquoise colour which looks fantastic on snow so yeah. any products that are out to you what's kind of hot oh ski wise um, well today I was doing freestyle ski so that's kind of what's in my mind and I actually really had fun on the Armada ARW 100 
Yeah. It was actually great. And the conditions we've got today, like with the kind of soft snow, kind of a little bit slushy, just jumping around on them, sailing through it all was great fun. Have you have you skied the line Pandora? I have, yeah. Amazing. So there's a, so just if you're listening, it's a line, line Pandora. There's a whole range, men and women, same name, different widths, and every model is just phenomenal. Real playful, makes you want to go and be a child on the hill, but just even the performance on the firm snows, that's what's been so surprising for how easy they are on the soft, they're pretty cool. We've had real variable, we had powder at the start of the week, we had the heavy rainfall, we've had refreeze, and we've had spring slush, it's been amazing. We've only three days in, almost all four seasons in one day, so hopefully you found that interesting, useful, but yeah, watch out for what's coming in four line and all the media and in the shops for next season, it's quite exciting. Ian, I hope that's interesting, and I look forward to talking to you when we're back. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. So that was really interesting hearing from Al just then. We were just talking, uh, Preet and I, kind of uh, off air while that was uh, playing, about gloves. And when we did the gloves uh, episode, we talked about the you know inner layers and then the regular gloves. And Al even said he uses waterproof outer layers for some things. That's three layers of gloves. You made it up to five, <laughs> Preet, I think. <laughs> It's just with that, you know, when that wind hits, it can be so cold. And, you know, and there's things I don't have to think about as well, don't forget. So I'm not having to think about waterproof layers. I'm on a very dry, windy continent. But that wind chill can be so cold. And at the end of the day, you need your hands for everything. Every hour when I need to get food, I need dexterity to put my tent up. My hands have to be nice and cosy. In the uh, trail race I did in uh, Ladies Out, it's kind of interesting. Earlier on, my hands were warm. I had gloves on from the start, fairly thick, you know, waterproof and windproof gloves, and they were fine in the sun. But it was just that point where the sun was going down, where the wind was blowing and they were the coldest. And actually, once the sun dropped below the horizon, the wind uh, wasn't as strong and it, it seemed to become easier again, even though it was later and in the dark. It's yeah. counterintuitive. So we're moving towards the end now. I love feedback from all of our listeners. I really appreciate it. You can uh, tag me or find us at social at the Ski Podcast or send an email to the Ski Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, Dave Mills said, Perfect podcast for a dog walk. Uh, ski podcast just keeps getting better and better. Uh, that's very kind of you, Dave. Laura Jane Scholdis said, I recently found your podcast and it's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Scott said, I'm a recent discoverer of the show. It's been a nice companion by tuning and waxing a huge pile of my kids' skis. Good work, Scott. If you enjoy the podcast, you can always buy me a coffee if you want to. Buymeacoffee.com forward slash the ski podcast. Stir did that, said keep up the good work. And Charlotte also bought me a coffee and said, I discovered your podcast last week. I've been really enjoying it. I went skiing for the first time this year after wanting to go for years and fell in love with it. I've been listening to all your episodes since I got back and they've helped me learn more about the sport and relive great memories from my holiday. And that is really exciting to me because... I love the fact that people are listening to this podcast and it's actually getting them out on the slopes. I know lots of our listeners, you know, are very experienced skiers and snowboarders who travel all over the world. But Charlotte, that message I really enjoyed in particular. Now, if you like the podcast, there are three things you can do to help. You can review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. That helps other people find us. You can subscribe. And that way, every episode will automatically be downloaded for you. So you can catch up with all of our back episodes at your leisure. And you can book your ski hire with Intersport Rent using the code Ski Podcast or take the link in the show notes. And there are now 203 episodes to catch up with. And as always, I checked our stats. 169 of those were listened to in the last week, which is great. 59% of you are in the UK which means 41% of you are elsewhere in the world. And I had a look at that as well. We've got places as diverse as Malaysia, Kazakhstan, Mexico, and Kenya. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, thank you for giving us your time. There is so much to listen to in our back catalogue. Just go to skipodcast.com, search around the tags and categories, and you're bound to find something of interest to you. But for now, you can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at The Ski Podcast. I'd like to thank Intersport for sponsoring the show and thank all of my contributors today, uh, Andy, Alex, Bethany, Katie, Al, Amy, and of course, my special guest today, Preet Shandy. Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> and finally, listener, thank you for joining us. Until next time, goodbye. Goodbye.